If you suffer from claustrophobia, this is probably not a good video for you. But before I get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house and line the floor next to their bed with Lego pieces and then set off their fire alarm. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In Mexico, there is a very deep body of water called the Blue Hole that formed after this huge sinkhole filled with water. And because the visibility inside of the Blue Hole is so good, it's become a very popular swimming and underwater diving site. But at the bottom of the Blue Hole, 84 feet down, there is this little tiny opening that almost looks like the drain at the bottom of your bathtub, except it's just big enough that a grown person with scuba tanks on could wriggle through it. And if they did, they'd be entering into a vast network of tunnels and caves that have never been mapped, and many of them have never been explored. In 1976, two recreational divers from Oklahoma and were exploring that deep section of the Blue Hole when they got lost and drowned. When the police went in, they started to get lost themselves, and when they finally located the bodies and brought them up again, they told the owners of the land that the Blue Hole was on that that section of the cave is incredibly dangerous. And until you get someone in here to professionally map it out, you really should not be letting anyone go down there. And so the owners decided, you know what, instead of mapping this out, let's just seal it off permanently. And so they put this huge metal grate over it and bolted that down. And then they put a whole bunch of boulders over that sealed up metal grate. Fast forward to 2016 and an elite diving organization called the ADM Exploration Foundation that literally goes around the world exploring unmapped caves and professionally maps them, they reached out to the owners of the Blue Hole Cave and said, hey, we'd be happy to map out your forbidden section. And the owners granted them permission. So this would be the first time in 40 years that anyone had been in the deepest section of the Blue Hole. One of the divers that was gonna be on this excursion was a guy named Shane Thompson. He had been a diving instructor for the United States Navy before becoming an advanced scuba instructor in San Diego. All in, he had about 20 years of diving experience, most of it the cave diving variety. On March 26th, 2016, the boulders were removed and the grate was unbolted and the entrance to the forbidden section of the Blue Hole was now open. Shane had actually been told to stay on land as a safety standby diver, while another diver named Mike Young was gonna be the first into the cave and would just explore the upper section. But as soon as Mike Young got in the water that morning, a couple minutes later, Shane was in the water after him. And Mike remembers as he was making his way down the main cavern section before getting to the actual forbidden entrance, looking up and seeing Shane coming towards him and thinking, huh, I thought he was supposed to stay on land, but he figured someone must have told him to go in. And so he didn't think much about it. And so Shane and Mike continued down to the entrance. Shane would be the first one to wriggle his way through this very claustrophobia inducing entrance. Once he was through, Mike followed after him. And at this point, it's pitch black. I mean, there's a little bit of light up in the main cavern, but once you're down below in the forbidden section, you can't see anything. So they both got their high powered flashlights out and immediately as they're kicking it out down the tunnel, they realize there's a lot of silt inside of this section. I mean, no one's been down here in 40 years, so everything is just kind of settled. And so their lights aren't really that good. It would be like driving in really intense fog and turning on your high beams. That's not gonna do anything. You're just gonna illuminate the fog around you. But they were kind of expecting this, so they just slowly made their way forward before Shane identified a tunnel that kind of branched off to the right. And so Shane is pointing his light down this tunnel. Mike sees Shane pointing it, so he goes up and he looks too. And they can see there is an opening at the end of this tunnel, maybe 20, 30 feet down that appears to open up into a much larger cavern. But what they were not able to see from their position, or perhaps just in haste they didn't realize this, is the tunnel actually starts big and then funnels down to almost a point. And in order to get into that larger cavern at the end of the tunnel, you basically need to force yourself through that hole. It is not an easy space to fit through. But either way, Shane takes off first, Mike follows him, and as they're moving down this tunnel, the silt is getting kicked up very dramatically all around them. And so now they cannot tell that the walls are basically closing in on them. And as they're getting closer and closer to what they think is gonna be this huge cavern, they actually suddenly get stuck. Shane gets stuck first, Mike comes up 
alongside him because it's so silty he can't see. And he swims right between Shane's leg and the wall and gets wedged. Mike stays calm and begins to push himself backwards to just retreat out of the situation he is in. He can't see anything, but he can tell what he needs to do. Shane, meanwhile, who's basically right in front of him, he starts kicking like a madman. In fact, his fins are hitting Mike in the head and all the silt is getting kicked up. And so Mike just continues to push himself back all the way back about 10 or 15 feet, while Shane, in a total panic, instead of coming backwards towards Mike, begins going forward through this tiny little narrow opening and somehow manages to force himself into this chamber. Mike has retreated back out to the main hallway and he's just waiting for Shane to do the same thing. But when he never shows up, Mike goes back down the tunnel, he goes right up to the little entrance into this cavern and he pokes his head in and he scans the light around and he doesn't see Shane anywhere, but he sees right away that there's all these different exits into different tunnels that shoot all over this cavern. And remember, this is a totally unexplored section, and so there's no way for him to know where any of these go. But he knows Shane had to have gone this way. It's only been a few moments. He's got to be in here somewhere. And so he takes a deep breath, and he begins forcing himself through this tiny little hole, which took him quite a while because Shane, when he went through, it was adrenaline and panic that pushed him through, which is probably why he did it so quickly. Mike really struggled to get through it. But once he was through, he pointed his light up and he looked for the biggest opening to one of those tunnels and he began swimming up after Shane. And after a very long and windy and at times incredibly narrow where Mike is second guessing himself why he's even doing this, he manages to get to the end and it's a dead end and curled up at the very back of the dead end was Shane. His mouthpiece was out and he was deceased. Mike was unable to recover him this day. He had to go all the way back out, force himself back through that hole and go up to the surface and get some other people involved before they could come back and recover his body. So the running theory is that when Shane panicked and began swimming through that tight little space into that chamber, he must have somehow believed that he had gotten turned around and was making his way towards the exit. Now, it's easy for us to say, dude, you're in a tight little tunnel and you couldn't even get out. How could you have possibly turned around? But in reality, when you're stuck hundreds of feet underground in a tunnel that is unexplored, silt's been kicked up all around you, someone's blocking your way behind you, there's something blocking your way ahead, and you're pinched all around on your side by rocks. The mind can do some pretty crazy and delusional things. And once he pushed through that hole using adrenaline to force himself through, he went up thinking, I'm gonna get out, I'm gonna get out except he went into a dead end. And by the time he reached the end, either his mouthpiece was knocked out or he passed out and he dropped the mouthpiece out of his mouth. But either way, it shows you what can happen when you are trapped underwater and you panic. After Shane's body was recovered, they resealed the forbidden section. And to this day, no one is allowed to go in again. Indian Springs is a very popular underwater diving location in Florida. Deep below the surface, there are hundreds and hundreds of miles of tunnels that are both explored and unexplored. The majority of the unexplored tunnels are down at the 300 foot mark, which is significantly deeper than the average recreational diver goes. In fact, below 120 feet, you need specialized equipment and training, and very few people have that. In November of 1991, a specially trained, specially qualified, group of elite divers went to Indian Springs to conduct a research dive down at the 300 foot mark. They were basically looking for unexplored passageways that they could explore and map out. There was a number of divers that were going to be a part of this dive, but the only two that were going to be passing through something called Squaw's Restriction were Parker Turner and Bill Gavin. Squaw's Restriction is this very narrow section of Indian Springs that's located down at the 120 foot mark. If you think of Indian Springs like an hourglass, you have a big open space up top, you get a big open space down below, and Squaw's Restriction is that tiny little space space in the center of the hourglass. Before they began this dive, they threw a line down through Squaw's restriction all the way down to the 300 foot mark that had an anchor at the end of it. And this would serve as their guideline so that when they were going down deep, if silt kicked up or visibility was obstructed for any reason, they always had a way to reference where they needed to go up or down. On the morning of November 17th, Bill and Parker put on their dive gear, they fired up their underwater scooters they were using, and they began their descent. They made it down to Squaw's restriction and one by one, they would lead with their scooter and their body would follow along past and each of them were able to get through without any issue. Once on the other side, they took note 
that on the wall next to them, and this will matter later on, they noticed a sign that had been placed there. It was a very distinctive up and down arrow to show upstream and downstream flows. And so they took mental note that there was this distinctive arrow sign right at the bottom of Squaw's restriction, and they continued down. They stopped at 140 feet, and they kind of looked around for a couple of minutes before continuing all the way down to 300 feet, which is where they were intending to go. And they explored for about 25 minutes before looking at their watches and saying, yep, we gotta go back up. So with one hand on their scooters and one hand on the guideline, they begin making their ascent. And as they're getting closer and closer to Squaw's restriction, they start noticing these huge clouds of silt just in the middle of the water all around them. And they didn't cause this. They were not in an area where it was so tight they were kicking up silt. And it had been quite a while before they had come down through Squaw's restriction. So this really couldn't be the silt that they had kicked up when they had first come into the cave. And so they looked at each other and thought, hmm, that's a little bit weird. I wonder what's going on above us. But they both kind of shrugged and thought, eh, it can't be that big of a deal. And again, holding on to that guideline, they keep on going up, up, up until their hands stop because the guideline is now leading them into sand and rock and mud as if the guideline is going into the wall. And they're looking at what they're holding on to and it doesn't make any sense. And without communicating at all, they both are thinking, okay, let's go back down and make sure we're in the right place because it seems like we hit a dead end here. And so they turn around and as they're going down the guideline now, again, there's no other lines down here. There isn't another way to get mixed up, but it's human instinct to think, let me just, let me just retrace my footsteps here. As they're going down, they see on their left, the distinctive up and down arrow that they saw when they came in. And that's when they stopped and looked at each other and they realized Squaw's restriction has caved in. We're trapped. Each of the men had a slate where they could use a grease pen to write a message and hold it up and show their dive partner. And that was how they communicated. And at this point, Parker wrote, what are we gonna do now? And Bill wrote back, let's look around. And so they turn around and they follow the guideline back up to the cave in and they start trying to clear the debris away, but they're finding it almost impossible because as soon as they move something out of the way, whatever is on top just pushes down into it and fills it back in. After a couple of minutes of doing that and all the silt is in their faces, they couldn't even hold their slates up to talk to each other because the visibility was so bad. So they both went lower in the water column to where there was no silt around them and they both looked at each other and that's when Parker held up his air gauge and showed Bill I only have about 10 minutes of air left. And that's when Bill looked at his air gauge and he realized he too only had about 10 minutes of air left. Parker scribbles something on his slate and he holds it up to Bill and it just says, what are we gonna do now? And Bill, not knowing what else to say, just wrote, hold on, I'll take a look. And so Bill leaves the guideline and swims over to another section away from Squaw's restriction in hopes he might find some other exit out of the space they're in, even though he knew full well there wasn't anything besides Squaw's restriction. And after a couple of minutes of looking around and not finding an additional exit, he goes back over to where Parker had been when he had left him except Parker's not here anymore. And Bill suddenly thinks maybe he's found a way to get through this. And so Bill, with almost no air left, grabs the guideline and swims up into the silty cloud and gets to the cave-in to discover it's still caved in. However, he sees the base of Parker's tanks wedged in the obstruction itself. And he's looking at the tanks thinking, how did Parker get in that position? And then he realizes that's just his tanks. Parker is not attached to them anymore. And that's when Bill realizes what Parker probably had done. Parker had tried to force himself through the obstruction and probably got about halfway before becoming completely wedged and stuck himself. And he had to make the terrifying decision to take one more good breath and then ditch your air tanks and try to swim on a breath hold to the set of spare tanks they had set up about 100 meters away above Squaw's restriction. But at this point, regardless what's happened with Parker, his tanks were positioned in a way that it had created a little bit of an opening in the obstruction that Bill was able to swim through with his tanks on. Now he has almost no air left, and so once he got through, he realized he had about 30 seconds of air, and he swam as fast as he could to the spare tanks, expecting hoping to see Parker on them breathing and alive. But unfortunately, right as they came into view, Parker wasn't anywhere to be seen. Bill swims as fast as he can. He actually literally runs out of air and is on a breath hold himself by the time he reaches these tanks. He takes a huge gulp of air, and after he calmed down, he took his light out and he scanned around and he found Parker and he was floating, deceased clearly about 30 meters away. They had made it pretty far on a breath hold, but had just gone slightly off and he didn't have any of his equipment. It was all attached to his tanks. 
And so in total darkness, he was just blindly swimming and did not locate the air tanks. And you can only imagine what his final few seconds were like. Before all of this happened, when Parker and Bill were down at 300 feet, some of the limestone broke off from the ceiling, landed in such a way that it caused this huge underwater mudslide and it all funneled down, completely blocking up Squaw's restriction. For any diver who can stomach the risks, Bushman's Hole is a world-class diving spot. It's located on a privately owned game farm in South Africa. In the middle of the farm's 11,000 acres sits this massive crater in the ground that from rim to rim is hundreds of feet wide. If you hike down the crater to the middle, there's this little tiny basin of water that almost looks like an oversized puddle. This is the entrance to Bushman's Hole. Once you step into this little puddle and push your way through the very claustrophobia-inducing entrance, you open up into the biggest freshwater cave in the world that goes down to nearly 900 feet. For the people that have been in there, they say it's unbelievable and it's like spacewalking. For young South African Dion Dreyer, the pull to go to Bushman and explore it was irresistible. Dion had always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie. By the time he was 17, he was racing cars and building motorcycles. And by the time he was 20, he had picked up a new activity, cave diving. Dion had logged about 200 dives before he was invited by a diving group to go to Bushman's Hole and explore it on Christmas break 1994. They were planning a descent to 492 feet, so about the halfway point of the cave, and they needed one more diver, and so Dion was thrilled to go. The dive was going great, but on the way up, as they were making their ascent, the diver ahead of Dion looked back at him, and Dion seemed fine. He gave the hand signal that everything was going great. He had his flashlight out. And then about 30 feet higher in the water, that same diver turned around to check on Dion and Dion wasn't there anymore. And in fact, this guy saw his flashlight that was still attached to him, basically wavering as it sunk farther and farther down Bushman's hole. This diver immediately stops the group above him and he turns around and starts swimming as fast as he can down to try to get to Dion. But Dion was sinking so, so quickly that this diver realized that it's a suicide mission if I try to go down there. I will either pass out or run out of air. And so so deeply saddened, this group of divers had to turn around and leave Dion at the bottom of Bushman's Hole. Although the other divers didn't know for sure, they told Dion's parents that most likely he had suffered from a deep water blackout and then had drowned. When authorities were notified about what happened to Dion, they sent a robot down to the bottom of Bushman's Hole to just locate his body before they send a person down there but they never could find his body. They could only ever find his helmet. Dion's parents are devastated. They're never gonna see their son again. And since they don't have a body to bury, they decide to go down to Bushman's Hole and put a plaque up next to the entrance to commemorate their son. 10 years later, Dave Shaw, who was a 50 year old, extremely audacious cave diver, was passing the 800 foot mark inside of Bushman's Hole, becoming the third person ever to reach this depth. Shaw touched down on the sloping bottom of the cave. He detached from the cave reel, took out his flashlight and began swimming around the bottom. As he was scanning around, he looked about 50 feet to his left and he saw something he immediately recognized. It was a human body. They were on their back with their arms stretched out towards the surface, and when Shaw went over to them, he immediately recognized that this is Dion Dreyer. Ever since Dion died inside of Bushman and had never been recovered, any diver that went in there was keeping their eye out in case they saw him. Shaw examines Dion to see if he's gonna be able to be pulled to the surface, if he's solid enough to be pulled to the surface, and he can tell that his hands have skeletonized as well as his skull, although his mask is still placed directly on his skull. But his wetsuit and his tanks had kind of kept the rest of his body pretty tight, which gave him some mass, which meant he'd be able to move him. But as soon as Shaw tried to move him, he couldn't get him to budge because his tanks were caught on something. And so Shaw stayed there for a minute trying to get him free, but he couldn't do it. And that's when Shaw started to think, okay, this is getting irresponsible. I'm gonna die down here too if I don't start making my ascent soon. So he ended up tying a line to Dion's body so he could be located again, and then Shaw began the very slow ascent back to the surface. On the way back up, Shaw felt an extreme sense of connection with Dion. He really felt bad for this kid, and all he wanted to do was get him back on land to give back to his family, to give them some closure. And so when he got on the surface, he immediately contacted authorities and said, I'm gonna go back down and I'm gonna get him. And Shaw also called Dion's parents and told them, I am gonna retrieve your son. 
and his parents were apparently overjoyed. They couldn't believe they were going to get to see their son again. After lots and lots of planning, Shaw's recovery of Dion was scheduled for January 8th, 2005. The dive was going to take 12 hours, and it wasn't just going to be Dave doing the retrieval. It was going to be like a relay race. Dave would be the first one down, and a couple minutes after he entered the water, another diver would go in who would stop about 100 feet above Dave, and then a third diver would go in and stop 100 feet above the second diver, and so on and so forth. Dave would put the body bag over Dion and then carry his body up to the first guy who would turn around, bring the body up to the next guy, and the next guy to the next guy until Dion was out of the water. At 6.13 in the morning, Shaw entered the water with a camera on his helmet to film the operation. Shortly after he submerged, Dion's parents walked down to the edge of the water to watch. They showed up intentionally late so as not to put added pressure on Shaw. Shaw dropped very quickly to the bottom of Bushman's Hole. He actually arrived about a minute and a half faster than he expected to. As soon as he got down, he shined his light and he found Dion's body. He went over to him, he got the body bag out, and he got to work. 13 minutes after Shaw had submerged, the diver who was slotted above him, that would be the first to receive Dion's body, began looking for signs that Shaw was done and was moving up towards him. But when he looked down, he saw Shaw's flashlight wasn't moving. This diver continued to watch the flashlight very intently to make sure his eyes weren't playing tricks on him. And after a couple of minutes and still no movement, this diver begins going deeper and deeper to try to get a better look at Shaw to see what's going on. And when he got a little bit closer, it became very clear that Shaw was not moving. This diver immediately goes into rescue mode and starts going straight down to get to Shaw to try to help him if he still can. And as he's moving down, he hears this fizzling sound and he looks at his wrist and he can tell that one of his gauges has broken. And this gauge was vital to the dive and it meant he would not be able to get down there. And so with a heavy heart, he had to turn around and go back up. And because of the depth at which they were diving, he could not just go right to the surface and tell everybody what had happened. He needed to stop at various decompression stops along the way. But he had a slate and on it, he wrote in his grease pen, Dave's not coming back. And he swam the slate up to the next diver who would have received Dion's body, but instead receives this slate. He takes the slate up to the next diver, to the next diver, to the next diver, all the way up to the surface. As soon as this message was read out loud to the group standing around Bushman's Hole, which included Dion's parents, there was 30 seconds of stunned silence. No one could believe this was happening. And then after the silence, Dion's parents are beside themselves. Not only are they not going to see their son probably ever again, but they feel like they are somehow responsible for Shaw's death. Eventually, by the end of the night, all of the other divers that were in the water that day successfully exited the cave and were just fine. As for Shaw, much like Dion, there really wasn't a good way to get him out. And so everyone came to terms with the reality that he was going to be down there with Dion probably forever. The news was so devastating that the team decided to leave all their equipment in place. Eventually, they did need to go down and collect their gear. So everybody goes down to the edge of Bushman's Hole. And before they begin retrieving all of the lines, they sang Amazing Grace in memoriam for the lost diver. Afterwards, they started pulling up the lines, and as they're doing that, they notice all these bubbles coming up from the bottom of the cave. And they looked a little bit closer, and it was Shaw's body and Dion's body. Basically, Shaw had been attached to this line, and he had managed to free Dion before he had passed. And so when they pulled the line, both of them were freed, and they floated to the surface. And so even though Shaw would die doing it, he was able to get Dion out of Bushman's cave for his family. After the two bodies were taken out, they noticed that the camera on Dave's head was still intact and it had filmed everything all the way through his final moments. And so they took the tape out and they watched it forward and backwards, slow-mo, frame by frame, and they analyzed it to the point where they understood what happened. When Shaw gets down to Dion, Dion's body that had previously been stuck, and that was the reason Shaw had not been able to free him the first time, somehow he's become unfree and he's now free floating. And Shaw is having a really hard time trying to control this free floating body and his body is literally breaking apart in front of him. As Shaw is trying to wrangle his body, you can hear him start grunting, his breathing is getting elevated, and he's totally losing control of the situation, and the bottom of this cave is slanted, and it's all silty and muddy, and so in the camera, you see all this mud and silt getting kicked around, and the visibility is very poor, and after it clears, you see Shaw has gotten completely tangled in some line that's also tangled on Dion. So basically, Dion has become his anchor. At this point, Shaw shifts 
his focus to try to get the lines off of himself. And you can hear his breathing now is becoming much more desperate. It almost sounds like he's gulping for air. And probably at this point, although we don't know for sure, he's suffering from narcosis, which is a condition that divers will run into where it's like you've drank a whole bunch of alcohol on an empty stomach. It's like you're totally drunk and you're confused. And it's clear that he's becoming a little bit disoriented. And instead of going away from Dion's body to try to go back up and save yourself, instead he turns and starts fumbling with Dion's midsection and then he gets out a pair of scissors, but he doesn't use them, he just holds them. Finally, he turns away from Dion because it's clear you're not gonna be able to get him out at this point. And with the scissors in hand that he never used, because again, he's probably suffering from narcosis and he's confused, he starts beginning to make his way over to the area where you can go back up, but he starts slowing down his breathing becomes tragically desperate, and then it becomes silent, and then there's no more movement, and Dave Shaw is dead. 10 days after the bodies were recovered from Bushman's Hole, Dion's parents, although they are absolutely devastated about what happened to Shaw, and they feel very guilty, but at the same time, they're so excited because they get to go to the morgue and see their son again for the first time in 10 years. They don't care what state his body's in. Just the fact that he's actually here, that their actual son is going to be in front of them was just overwhelming for them. And when they went in, they were really fixated on the fact that he had underwear on that they both recognized. Apparently, they had bought him a set of jockey underwear and he was wearing jockey underwear. As strange as it is, it was like they got to bond with their child one more time. So that's going to do it, guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought of these three stories, and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's stories and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and line the floor next to their bed with Lego pieces and then set off their fire alarm. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username is the same for both platforms. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.